I want to welcome everybody to the Day of Dialogue's second session. We have more events than we have time of the day, so we had to double up our events. And you've chosen to attend this event on U.S. Foreign Affairs, and for that, we thank you. My name is Phil Dalton. I'm a professor of rhetoric and public advocacy here at Hofstra, as well as the director of the Center for Civic Engagement. Uh, the Center for Civic Engagement's mission is uh, extraordinarily important at this moment in time. It is one of encouraging students to take an active role in their communities and to foster broader national and international dialogue. I believe that the substance of the present discussion is just as important as participating in the discussion. And participating includes not just speaking, but also listening to others participate, people with whom you might disagree. We need to know and see uh, that we can disagree without being disagreeable. This event could not have been possible without the support of various people and offices. The center is grateful to the provost's office for its continued support as well as university relations. Additionally, we are indebted to the executive director of the Hofstra Cultural Center, Kathleen Collins, for all the work she has invested in today's events. We're also thankful to CCE, the center's graduate assistant for community partners, Gabriela Rojas, and CCE graduate assistant for civic literacy and on-campus events, Callie Wynn. I should also recognize the Center for Civic Engagement's fellows who've been instrumental in conceiving. Oh, shoot, Callie's on the other end. Helping market all of them okay. and administering them. Uh, we couldn't have held this event without anyone who's been mentioned. And now I'd like to hand off uh, to today's moderator, Associate Professor of Political Science, Paul Fritz. And just before I do, I ask you to note that I'll put a link in the chat for other events that'll be hosted throughout this day. Um, please give it a look and RSVP it for events, bring a friend, bring a roommate. And um, we, after having thanked everyone, I'd like to introduce Paul. Paul? Hi, thanks, Phil. Um, I'm Paul Fritz. I'm Associate Professor of Political Science, and it's a, a joy to be on this panel, to be a moderator for this. I want to echo everything Dr. Dalton said about the importance of this. And I also want to say how lucky we are to have our guest, uh, Stephen Kinzer, who I uh, will introduce now. Um, his uh, bio is uh, way too long and he's way too accomplished for me to go through it all. So I, with his permission, I'm going to cut it just a little bit short so we save as much time as possible to, uh, to hear from him. Um, but Stephen Kisner is a, a correspondent who's covered more than 50 countries on five continents. His articles and books have led the Washington Post to place him on, among the best and popular foreign policy telling. Uh, he spent 20 years working for the New York Times, most of it as a foreign correspondent in places such as Nicaragua, Germany, and Turkey during very interesting times in Nicaragua and Germany in particular, uh, but also Turkey as well. He's the author of many acclaimed books, including Bitter Fruit, The Untold Story of the American Coup in Guatemala, Blood of Brothers, uh, Life and War in Nicaragua, Overthrow, America's Century of Regime Change from Haiti to Iraq, uh, which I know a lot of our students read um, uh, in different classes at different periods. Um, the brothers, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, and their secret world war, and his newest book, uh, which is Poisoner in Chief, Sidney Gottlieb, and the CIA Search for Mind Control. Uh, there are many others, so that's just a sampling of, of his acclaimed books. Um, after leaving the New York Times in, in, 20, uh, in, in 2005, excuse me, uh, Kinzer taught journalism, political science, and international relations at Northwestern University and Boston University. And he is now a senior fellow at the Watson Institute for International Public Affairs at Brown, uh, Brown University and writes for World Affairs, a World Affairs column for uh, the Boston Globe. Um, it's our great pleasure to have Mr. Kinsner with us today. Um, I believe we have him until 1045. Um, so what we'll do is, is I'll turn it over to Mr. Kinzer to, to, for him to present um, what he has for us today. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get in a couple questions um, when he's done. And uh, following you know, his, his departure at 1045, we can continue the discussion um, and talk about the issues that he raised uh, until around 11 o'clock. So uh, with that, it's my honor to turn it over to Stephen Kinzer. Oh, thanks for that introduction, uh, abbreviated as, as it had to be. <laughs> um, I'm coming to you from the campus of Brown University. I quite possibly am the only living human in my building. 
but um, we do have a system where for small seminars, teaching is allowed in person and I have a small seminar to teach this afternoon. So here I am sitting here all alone in my beautiful uh, Watson Institute building. Uh, and I'm thrilled that at least a number of you have decided you want to spend part of your morning thinking about world affairs and thinking about America's place in the world. That puts you in a fairly small cult, I'm afraid. Uh, as the presidential debates were approaching in the foreign affairs and international relations circles in which I travel, uh, there was a lot of talk about what would be the good questions about world affairs to ask the presidential candidates. Like, let's come up with some, not the dopey questions they're gonna ask, but the insightful, sophisticated questions that we would like to ask. So what happened in the debates? Neither the sophisticated questions nor the dopey questions were asked. Nothing was asked. World affairs hardly came into the presidential debate at all. We have been fighting a war in Afghanistan for 20 years and the word Afghanistan did not even appear, was never spoken at the presidential debate. Um, so that shows you uh, the importance that ordinary Americans and even presidential candidates and, and leading public officials place on world affairs. That's really a shame because the United States has such an ability to affect the rest of the world for good and for bad. Uh, in many countries, the president of the United States has more say over the lives of ordinary people than the president of their own country. So they actually should be allowed to vote in our elections and I'm sure they'd clamor to do so. Uh, instead, uh, we pay almost no attention to everything that we can do in the world. And, and I find this odd in a particular way. Uh, you know, I, had a, I once had a conversation with a former president of the United States, that was Jimmy Carter. And he told me this interesting story. He said, um, when I first got to be president, I quietly asked all the former presidents to come and visit me, just one-on-one -on -one chat to try to give me an idea of how do you be president? What, what do you do when you have this job? And he said, when Nixon came to see me, he had one piece of advice and that was, don't get caught up in domestic affairs. You never get anything done. When you come into office, there'll be a welfare crisis and there'll be a housing crisis and there'll be a policing crisis and there'll be an environmental crisis. All those crises will still be there when you leave. Yeah, you can play around the edges a little bit, but you can't really accomplish that much because there are so many other factors pushing you one way or another. But in world affairs, it's different. You can do so much, so concentrate on that. This was Nixon's advice to uh, Jimmy Carter. It really is true. I mean, look at Trump, for example, He's had four years. He hasn't even been able to build his wall uh, in Me with Mexico. But with one stroke of the pen, he was able to pull the United States out of the Paris uh, Climate Accords and with out of the Iran nuclear deal. So uh, the power of the president of the United States to shape the world is enormous. And there's such a disconnect between the enormity of that power on the one hand and the lack of interest of Americans and American political leaders on the other hand. It's never ceased to impress me how uh, easy it is to make an entire career in American politics and spend decades at the highest levels of American public life and still never think at all seriously about world affairs. So, uh, there's a little group of us that feel like we're beating our spoon on the high chair and it's nice to know there's a few others of you out there uh, willing to listen and, and take pity on us and perhaps join our cause. So uh, as we face a presidential election, uh, naturally there are all sorts of different uh, foreign affairs issues. Uh, this, in this cycle we're thinking about how are we going to get out of Afghanistan if we are, what are we going to do about Syria, um, how are we going to deal with Russia? How are we going to deal with the rise of China? Um, but beyond all those individual concerns is a, is a larger one, one that is overwhelming all of American foreign policy and views of the world. And that is, what's the role that we want to play in the world? What should the United States be and do in the world? Shall we be 
a country that just tries to be a model for others? Or should we aggressively go out and try to make other countries better and more like us the way we think they should be? This has been a debate in America ever since the before the founding of our country. You'll remember the famous speech by the Puritan leader, John Winthrop, who said, uh, we shall be as a city upon a hill and the eyes of all people are upon us. We're still arguing about what he meant. Did he meant we will create a virtuous society and the eyes of other people will be on us and they might create virtuous societies as well? Or did he mean we live in a sinful world, we're virtuous people, so we need to go out into that sinful world and make it virtuous? We still haven't figured out which we want to do. As a matter of fact, I think Americans hold both views in their minds at the same time. One view is the United States is logically the dominant power in the world because we're so strong, we're so big, we're so powerful. As Secretary of State Madeleine Albright put it, we stand taller and see further than other countries. Therefore, it's logical that we should want to influence and shape the course of other countries. On the other hand, Americans would also tell you all countries should be allowed to go their own way. They shouldn't be pushed around by someone else. All countries should choose their own paths. Now, these are contradictory views. You can't believe both of them, that the US should shape the world and that all countries should shape their own futures. But we still do. We, we still maintain the idea that um, we can believe both things. And I think those two beliefs, uh, which contrast so strongly, come out in different proportions at different times, according to different circumstances. Now, uh, the, the idea that the United States should press its coercive power around the world is not new. As a matter of fact, if you want to talk about the history of American expansionism or interventionism into new lands, you could go all the way back to the first time the pilgrims moved out of Plymouth and started moving a couple of miles westward. Looking at the entire sweep of American expansion and the growth of American power, you can place the history of American empire into three chronological sections. First was continental empire. We decided that we needed to fill up North America. That was our manifest destiny. Then came overseas empire when we started taking colonies and islands in other parts of the world. And then finally, after the end of the Second World War, we made our leap to global empire. Now, the first big decisions that America made in terms of expanding overseas happened in the wake of our uh, wars in 1898. You might remember back from some uh, high school history class you took that the United States had what we call the Spanish-American War. We fought in Cuba. Um, then the United States fought a vicious, horrific war in the Philippines in which something like 200,000 people were killed. And this is a war that is totally unknown in the United States. I think Americans have completely forgotten that we ever fought a war in the Philippines and how horrific it was. As a result of those wars, the United States signed a treaty with Spain to take over Spanish colonies. That's when we acquired responsibility for Cuba. We took the Philippines, we took Puerto Rico and other islands. Uh, that treaty giving us control of those islands had to be ratified by the United States Senate. And that debate was probably the most important debate that was ever held in the history of the United States. It was even more important than the debate over slavery because the slavery debate was only about a phenomenon inside the United States. This debate over whether the United States should set out on the path of overseas empire was gonna shape the whole world. And when you read the transcripts of that debate back in the beginning of 1899 in the US Senate, you can sense that all the senators are fully aware that they're making a hugely historic decision. They realize this is not just about whether we're gonna take the Philippines. This is about whether a country that was once a colony, the United States, will now set out to take colonies. Can a country 
dedicated to the principle that all people are created equal and that nobody has the right to govern other people without their consent, go out and take colonies and try to dominate countries in other parts of the world. This was a 32 day debate and that Treaty of Paris was finally ratified with one vote more than the required two thirds majority. So the debate over how aggressively the United States should push itself into the outside world is a very old one. It goes all the way back to uh, 1898, 1899. So it's well over a hundred years old. Now that debate is still shaping American foreign policy. And it's the central question facing every American president. How do we want to deal with the rest of the world? Um, at the end of the Second World War, the United States made a fateful decision. We decided that uh, the rest of the world was weakened from war, that there was a great threat from Moscow in world communism, and that therefore was the duty and role and uh, obligation of the United States to go out and lead the world in a global crusade against our enemies. Uh, we did this in many ways for our own economic benefit and our own strategic benefit, but I think there was also an element of altruism in it. I think there were, really are many Americans who believe that the United States has something so good to give to the rest of the world that people believe we've been given a key here in the United States to how to build a successful and stable and prosperous society, how churlish it would be for us not to want to share that with the rest of the world. And if there are people in the world that don't want our help and don't want our example and don't want to become the kind of country we are, that might just be further proof of how backwards they are and how much they need our help. So for the entire period of the Cold War, from the end of the Second World War up until the fall of the Berlin Wall in, in 1990, a good half century, um, the United States assumed this role of global leadership. Uh, whenever we saw countries behaving in ways we didn't like, we intervened. And we had the power to shape other countries and to shake them, to destroy governments that we didn't like and to promote those we did like. Then at the end of the Cold War, the United States had a big choice to make. Essentially, uh, the institutions that we had built to confront the communist Soviet Union uh, seemed out of date because the Soviet Union was gone. But the United States did not take this as a moment to reassess our global role and to decide that we now could concentrate on our domestic problems and didn't have to insist on ruling the world. We took the opposite route. We decided we needed to dominate the world just as much as ever or more so. Today, the United States has troops in 170 countries in the world, if you can imagine that. We have 800 foreign military bases. The total number of foreign military bases of all other countries combined is less than 20. So the United States has created a unique, omnipresent global empire. And the next president of the United States, like the last president, is going to have to deal with how reasonable a commitment this is for the indefinite future. Now, I said that uh, the United States had intervened to shape the fate of many nations and that we had succeeded. Let me just take you through one example of this and show you what success looks like. Because uh, in, in journalism and in writing, we have an old cliche. It says, every story is either happy or sad, depending on where you end it. <laughs> so when the United States intervenes in another country, it can often, because of its great power, achieve the end that it wants. And if history would just stop there, everybody would be happy. But history doesn't stop. History keeps on happening. And that's why operations that seem like a success at first, from the perspective of history, don't. 
the United States intervenes in foreign countries and achieves its goal, then we forget about the intervention. We move on to the next one. We're on to some other country. But the people in that country where we intervene do not forget. The memory of these interventions burns and festers in their souls and in their hearts and their collective memories. And it shapes them for generations and it shapes their attitudes toward us. So I'm gonna give you just one example of this. In the early 1950s, the United States became irritated with Iran. Uh, Iran had just become a truly flowering democracy in the period after the Second World War. It had an elected leader and an elected Congress. Because it was a democracy, it was natural that the political leaders took the step that everybody in the country wanted. There was one great national project, and that was this. Iran is sitting on an ocean of oil, but all the oil is owned by a British company with an American banking system. So all the money from Iranian oil is going to promote well-being in other parts of the world while Iranians are living in terrible conditions. So the Iranian democracy decided overwhelmingly with unanimous votes in both houses of Congress uh, to nationalize the Iranian oil industry. That terrified the British, it terrified the Americans, and uh, the CIA took the lead in organizing a coup in which we overthrew the government of Iran. So the government that had nationalized Iranian oil was overthrown in the summer of 1953. The United States then placed our ally, the Shah of Iran, back on the peacock throne. It seemed like a great success. We got rid of a guy we didn't like, and we put in a new guy, the Shah, who would do everything we wanted. So let's just flash forward now. What happened afterward? The Shah ruled with increasing repression for 25 years as the United States backed him. That repression led to the explosion of the late 1970s, what we call the Islamic Revolution. That Islamic Revolution brought to power a clique of fanatically anti-American mullahs who've spent the last 40 years working intently and sometimes quite violently to undermine American interests all over the world. Uh, that Islamic revolution in Iran also emboldened Saddam Hussein, Iran's big enemy in next door Iraq. Well, we were so angry at Iran for overthrowing our Shah and then taking our diplomats hostage, we became allies of Saddam Hussein. Pre the president of the United States sent an envoy, Donald Rumsfeld, to meet with Saddam Hussein twice and ask him, what can we do for you? How can we be your partner? Saddam wanted helicopters. He wanted intelligence information about the movement of Iranian troops. We gave this all to him. That was the beginning of our death embrace with Saddam Hussein that spiraled down into the Iraq invasion and the tragedy that has unfolded there. That Islamic revolution in Iran also terrified the Soviet Union. The Soviets were afraid radical Islam would penetrate through their Southern Islamic republics. That's played a big role in sending the Soviet Union to invade Afghanistan. That pulled the United States into Afghanistan, where we are still stuck in this enormous quagmire. And because we were so angry about the hostage crisis, we never took notice of the fact, as it came out many years later, that those hostage takers, who we considered savages and nihilists, actually were reacting to what the United States had done in 1953. They later on wrote essays in which they said, look what happened in 53. The Iranians rose up and threw out our Shah, but the CIA working out of a basement in the US embassy organized a coup and brought the Shah back. Now it's 25 years later. We've thrown out the Shah again, same Shah. So we're afraid that the CIA agents in the basement of the embassy are gonna repeat history, do the same thing they did before. That's why we stormed the embassy. Americans didn't know any of this. So a lot of history came out of just a few weeks in the summer of 1953. Think of all the trouble the United States and Iran have had over the years and are still having. Think of the fact that Iran not only lost a popular leader when the CIA intervened in 1953, but lost its democracy forever. They've never been able to get back to the point that they were at before. So 
if we had not intervened in Iran in 1953, we might have had a thriving democracy in the heart of the Muslim Middle East all these 70 years. And I can hardly wrap my mind around how different the Middle East might look had that been the case. Multiply that times the different intervention, different times the Americans have intervened in Indonesia, in the Congo, in Nicaragua, in Cuba, in Chile, in so many other countries. The effects of these interventions keep playing out. Every president comes into office saying he wants to end the forever wars. We've had the last, we had three presidents now since uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. None of them have managed to do that. The, the forces that keep America involved in our foreign wars and our global political projects uh, are very powerful in American society. Politicians are always attracted to the idea that there's so much money being spent on those wars and those military bases that could be spent in the United States to deal with so many of our pressing problems. But the forces uh, behind the American global political project are also very powerful. Uh, and this will be uh, something that our, I think our next president is gonna have to deal with. I do think in closing though, that um, both political party leaderships are behind the American people on this. The American people I think are further along. American people, I do believe are at a point where there's a growing sense that it doesn't make, it's not logical for us to be insisting on ruling the whole world and to be constantly in confrontation with Russia and with China uh, rather than trying to take a more diplomatic approach and recognize that we can't rule the world forever. You know, the countries that have survived over many centuries like Iran or like China have done that by riding the tides of history. They realize that no country is on top forever. If you realize that, you can survive over a long time if you don't insist on being on top. But the United States has no experience with not being on top. We have to make a psychological transition to a new age. And politicians, just by the nature of politics and how long it takes you to reach the top of, uh, of political life, are generally products of an earlier generation. So I think the next president is gonna be pushed by the voting public to reassess the scope of America's global engagement and to look for ways that will allow the United States to exercise its power in a more diplomatic and cooperative way. Whether presidents will accept that and to what extent we are now at a point where our next president can find a popular consensus for dialing down the project of American global hegemony is gonna be one of the great questions we're gonna to have to answer over the next four years. Well, I think I've given you a, a brief overview and if there's anything I can do to respond to your questions or, uh, or answer any other comments, I'll be happy to do that. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Kinzer. That was uh, uh, very generous of you and, and, and very insightful. And um, I know I have a bunch of questions, but I think I would like to open it up to students first um, to be able to ask any questions they have. Now, um, if, if students, if, if, if you um, are able to raise your hand, I can call on you and you can unmute yourself. Um, if you can't use the raise hand function, you can use the chat function. Um, but I just want to throw it out there that the raised hand function would be easiest so I can keep an order of who is um, the question. So please jump in there. So, while you get going, maybe I'll ask one of my questions then. Um, Paul, there oh, are hands it. up. Oh, there are. I, I, I can't I, see so I saw Peter, is that your, Peter, unmute. Um. Okay. My question that I was going to ask is, why do you think for like the average person, foreign policy is just something that's so distant to them? That is a great question. And let me tell you, uh, international relations scholars spend a lot of time with their therapists asking that <laughs> question. Why doesn't anybody care about what I care about? Um, part of it, I think, has to do with the fact that the United States is so cut off geographically from the rest of the world. You know, if you live in... Uh, 
Kazakhstan or you live in Austria or you live in Bangladesh, you're surrounded by other countries. You always have to think about what the other countries are going to do. If Austria does something, well, what's Italy going to say? What's France going to say? How, how is Bulgaria going to react? You, you always have to measure your uh, diplomacy against other countries around you. The United States never has never had to do that. You just have happy Mexicans and stolid Canadians and rapidly declining fish stocks. We don't have to, we never really had to learn how to get along with anybody. Um, and so I think it allows for inward looking mindsets. Uh, in addition, of course, the United States has never known the scourge of war. I mean, nobody alive today has ever been alive when the United States was at war. Some people that have been out and understood what war is become particularly horrified by it. But uh, in a country like the United States where war is so distant, it just seems like a TV story. The phenomenon of the chicken hawks is, is very easy to develop. The people that want to send other people off to fight. War seems quite sanitary and uh, the horrors, the ravages of war seem so distant to us that maybe we don't grasp the fact uh, of how big an effect the United States can have in other countries. I mean, we are now supplying bombs made by Raytheon to Saudi Arabia to bomb targets, including school buses and weddings in Yemen. The next president could decide, I'm not gonna allow Raytheon to sell those bombs to Saudi Arabia. That would make a pretty big difference to somebody sitting in a hut in Yemen. Uh, but I don't think Americans focus on that. And I'll just add this one other point. One of my frustrations with um, some aspects of the new anti-racism, Black Lives Matter, uh, climate control, uh, climate change movements is that they don't tie their struggles closely enough in with the anti-imperial struggle in the world because those people are always being asked, well, how are you gonna pay for a Green New Deal? How are you gonna pay for free community colleges for everybody? How are you gonna pay for healthcare for everybody? Well, there is an answer. There is that huge pot of money that we're spending to maintain 800 military bases around the world and build uh, the most advanced weapons that humanity can conceive of. Uh, if you don't get the money from somewhere, you're not going to have it for the projects you want. So I would love to see people working for social justice in the, inside the United States more fully recognize and proclaim the connection between uh, the amount of money that we spend abroad and the limited amounts that we have left over for our domestic needs. Well, I don't see other hands right now, but maybe, oh. Um um, I see Robert Robert Foot Fort is has a question. Okay, yeah, and I just got to note that somebody can't seem to raise their hand. So, uh, Robert, and then uh, maybe Isabella. Oh, I'm sorry. I typed my question in the chat um, just because I have some like audio issues. Okay, so let me let me share it then. So uh, Robert asks. Um, uh, it says that how American presidents have promised to scale back America's military, military presence, but still haven't. Why do you think this occurs? Is it merely a lie that politicians tell, or does the executive branch simply not have the power to scale back America's global influence? That is a fascinating question. There's something about the, the air or the water in Washington. You know, th th there's a force in Washington that pulls politicians into the interventionist consensus because this consensus embraces almost all leading Democrats, almost all leading Republicans, almost all of the press, almost every think tank. So uh, why is it that uh, presidents are not able to break out of that or get sucked into that so easily? Uh, I, I give you a couple of examples. Um, President Trump, it's a perfect uh, light figure of this. When he was running for office, he had these tweets, we've spent trillions of dollars in the Middle East and we've gotten nothing for it there. It's a complete waste, we should get out. I mean, it sounded like George Washington saying, why quit our own to stand on foreign ground? But when he got into office, he didn't do any of that. 
he did not end a single foreign war. Now, at one time, he announced he was pulling all American troops out of Syria. There was a scramble among the generals and everything changed. Another time he announced, I'm pulling all American troops out of Afghanistan. Also, he went into a meeting and then he came out and said, well, the generals told me not to do it. President Trump named a, an ambassador to Afghanistan who is a firm believer in total American withdrawal from Afghanistan. The Senate would not even give that guy a hearing even to consider his nomination. Uh, another example I'll give you has to do with the hearings that I watched in part about President Trump's policy toward Ukraine. So they were focusing, the committee was focusing on this question of whether heavy weapons should be sent to Ukraine so that Ukraine could provoke Russia or that so that Ukraine would be better armed to fight with Russia or defend itself against Russia. So um, Trump drew some limitations on this. He doesn't want to arm the Ukrainians to the teeth right on the border with Russia. And I watched two American State Department, or one, one, dip one State Department diplomat and one diplomat from the, uh, or officer from the National Security Council testify. And basically this is what they said. There is a policy that we have toward Ukraine and it's been set by the interagency. I love this word. It's been set by the interagency. In other words, there's a, there's a consensus. The United States has a policy and the policy is we promote Ukraine because we want to provoke Russia. We want to defy Russia. And who is the president of the United States to come into the interagency and start saying, actually, we don't want to provoke Ukraine uh, to, to uh, fight with Russia. We, we don't want to send them a lot of weapons. There was a kind of uh, anger at the chutzpah of the president of the United States to show up and say he wants to change one of our foreign policies. So I do think uh, that the combination of the power of these arms lobbies and militarist lobbies in Washington and the weakness, the political unsophistication of President Trump, uh, plus his vulnerability to appeals from the arms industry has led him to keep talking the way he was talking, but not doing anything about it. Now, Trump is so obsessed with the idea that arms sales will uh, uh, raise the American economy that he essentially embraced Saudi Arabia when Saudi Arabia announced that it would buy huge amounts of American weaponry, which may not even actually be what they're doing. Uh, this is a very narrow way to shape American policy, but I can tell you um, there's a slow evolution. I was shocked to read within the last week an article in Foreign Affairs Magazine, which is a Bible for the American foreign policy establishment. And in there, there was an article saying that maybe America is spending too much on its weaponry. And it particularly mentioned the F-35 fighter plane, which is one of these enormous trillion dollar boondoggles. And the author of that article was Hillary Clinton, one of the great war promoters of our age. She is now coming around. So I do believe that maybe there'll be a little bit more space in the coming years uh, for, if, for uh, a, at least a slight loosening, or let's say a slight slowing of the American race to uh, arm the world and govern the world. I think we have time for another question. And I know Isabella um, has, uh, is, is, has one, so I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, hi, I just wanna thank you so much for being with us today. Your time and your knowledge is really appreciated. Elaborating on what you just shared as well as the fact that you talked about how the presidential debates have been lacking discourse about global affairs. What do you think is most important for voters to be focusing on in terms of foreign policy for both candidates before they cast uh, their votes or send in their ballots if they haven't already? If I'm gonna pick one issue that uh, you could call a global or international or foreign policy issue that I think should be at the top of the list, it would be climate change. Uh, and, but I would say in a larger sense, a change in our approach to the climate issue 
would also mean a move toward serious engagement with other countries and compromising with other countries. That also could shape our dealings with countries we consider adversaries like uh, Venezuela or Iran or Russia or China. It's not a good idea to divide the world into friends and enemies. The whole purpose of diplomacy is to promote the interest of your own country. It's not about emotion. It's not about liking somebody or approving somebody. So what I would look for in a presidential candidate is somebody who is willing to use diplomacy to compromise with other nations. You wanna look at other nations and look coldly at their interests. Leaders of other countries are not thugs or gangsters like our presidential candidates call them on TV. They're just promoting the interests of their own countries. In many cases, those interests conflict with ours or at least are different from ours. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean they're our enemy. What it means is we should look for areas in which they have interests that overlap with ours. And then from there, we can go on to start cooperating. But you constantly hear American presidential candidates talking about how they're going to fight wars, how they're going to end wars, how they're going to do wars better, how, which, where they're going to fight wars. One issue that never comes up in American presidential campaigns is peace. When did you ever hear a presidential candidate say, or, or be asked, what are your plans for making a more peaceful world? And that's what I think we ought to be asking our candidates. We are at uh, 1043, and I know Mr. Kinzer needs to leave by 1045. Um, so I, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your so generously uh, giving your time to us and, and providing your insight. Um, I want to thank CCE for holding this, putting this together. Uh, students, wonderful questions. We can continue this discussion. I know Mr. Kinzer has to go, but if you want to keep talking about the issues that he raised, I'll be happy to stay on and, and continue to just, uh, talk about them. Um, Rusty, did you want to add anything? Um, no, I mean, I thought that it was, um, you know, a very excellent presentation. I, I, I what I did feel, first of all, I'm really interested in what you have to say, Paul, <laughs> you know, who teaches this, this material, you know, as well. And I, I know you're moderating, but I'm hoping that you're going to call on yourself. Um, I mean, the thing that I was thinking as this was, you know, as I was listening to this talk is that it's not just that the issue of peace has been ignored and almost nothing has been said about the military budget. Um, and, you know, the problem that that poses in terms of, especially right now, where we absolutely need money for public health and education and aid to the states and the cities, you know, so all that has sort of just gone away. But I, I guess what I'm struck with is the extent to which Joe, Joe Biden um, has a foreign policy that's really pretty hawkish. Um, and, you know, to some degree, you know, he's getting a lot of support from the national security people, you know, veterans of different administrations, lots of people who supported, you know, George W. Bush or who were in that administration, you know, and so, you know, liberals might say, oh, isn't that great? We have all these, you know, CIA people and everybody supporting the president. But I guess my concern, you know, is, you know, if really a lot of the opposition that's being, you know, expressed is partly because people think his foreign policy isn't tough enough. Right, and that last debate was really like Joe Biden saying, "I'm, you know, I'm really tough. I'm going to stand up for the." So I'm sort of wondering, you know, myself, you know, what about the fact that that the that the Trump opponent is really advocating, you know, a military, strong military, and a kind of an interventionist perspective? You know, what, you know, where where do we go with that? Do you want me to respond or you want students to respond? Anybody, I, you know, yeah. so I'd love to hear from students about this, but yeah, um, I think I'm, students I'm, have a great perspective. I mean, I, love to, I would love to hear that too from if you have thoughts. So if people have questions or comments about that. Um, but if not, Paul, I guess I want to ask you about that. In other words, so it's not, it's not so clear that the, that the candidates for the presidency or even Congress, members of Congress are really, you know, addressing the issues that um, that Stephen Kinzer raised today that, you know, and 
again, is there an implication that the Democrats, if they win, actually will be tougher on other countries, you know, than than President Trump? Uh, so I think that that's a good question. We we haven't gotten any information on this, right? We get nothing in foreign policy in the debates. Um, the only, I mean, there are platitudes about keeping America strong and making sure the Pentagon is well funded and this kind of stuff, so that you get the normal hawkish stuff that does sell politically, right? That is electorally advantageous, especially for Democrats who, for several decades, have been tarred as sort of the dovish um, crowd. So they always try to show themselves to be tough. Um, I think that it puts them, it, it, it would put a Biden administration, if, if we get one, um, in a difficult position. Um, you know, and the reason I, I think that is even if Biden has been interventionist, but he's also been, and as vice president, he was um, mm -hmm. less hawkish than maybe right. Obama in a lot right. of ways, right? Opposing um, the, the surge in Afghanistan, um, opposing or at least raising big questions about the intervention in Libya um, and other instances. Um, so but there, there's a little bit there to say maybe Biden would be a little bit more cautious with this. And the Democratic primary probably pushed him that way a little bit more too, even though they didn't talk about it much, but you did have Bernie Sanders and others um, raising these issues. So we did hear much more about this in the Democratic primary than we did have in the presidential election. Um, but you still have, as, as Mr. Kinzer was saying, sort of this um, large, I mean, what he was referring to as the larger military industrial complex is pushing this um, and a disinterested American public. And the question, and so I don't think I have an answer for you, but the question that it raises for me is if the American public is in fact growing tired of the forever wars, which they are, the polling data shows that, right? The American public is tired of this. Um, but they don't pay much attention to foreign affairs. They don't really care that much other than hearing the platitudes from the characters. Who could drive this movement? Um, and in this, someone who studies foreign policy, at least question. have an outside, uh, outsized influence on the direction of foreign policy compared to domestic policy. The grassroots movements can change things in domestic policy easier than foreign policy. Um, so it's going to be up to, I think, a presidential administration to make any serious changes if there's an appetite for it. And maybe that's a, a Biden, a Biden presidency might have this opportunity if the Trump wins and he's able to govern better and not be steamrolled by the Defense Department, others, maybe he has an opportunity to do this. But I think from what, what I see, I think it's going to have to be an elite driven movement. Any other thoughts from people um, about this question? And I guess, you know, in terms of from the perspective of students, you know, I'm always being told uh, when I teach about foreign policy, and usually like after, you know, two sessions, somebody in my class is gonna say, oh my God, why didn't I know these things before? Oh, wow, that's amazing, right? And so, you know, I, I think the question of why, why is the public so ill-informed and why are people not paying attention um, to, to, this, to this issue? You know, I'm wondering if anybody, you know, has any thoughts about that. And, you know, and let, let me just throw in one other thing, um, you know, that's sort of complicating the problem. You know, my, I just did another panel about an hour ago about the state of our democracy. And in that panel, I was making a point um, that one of the things that's interesting about Donald Trump, as opposed to any of his predecessors, is he doesn't really do much work. And he's not interested, so people can give him briefing books so they could try to talk to him. He tunes out experts, okay? And that's a real contrast to other American presidents who, when they come into office, they're aware of what are the areas I don't know about, and then they turn to the relevant specialists to help them, right? So that sounds like a good thing about the other presidents, a bad thing about Donald Trump. But in fact, part of what happens to presidents when they come in, especially if they have no foreign policy experience. So then what happens is 
that they get can they get shaped by the so-called experts not not by us but by the so-called experts and um and so it's I'm, I'm making that point because even though probably all of us say oh you know pre, you know experts that's great but that's part of why it's very difficult to get a change in the policy you know, so what, for example, that you know, responding to Paul's example about Barack Obama and Afghanistan, right? So he runs a campaign. He doesn't promise to get out of Afghanistan, but in general, he's running a campaign that says the war on terror is like way out of control. We don't need to be operating this way. We need to really change it. That's his position. He comes into office, but he, and he's appointed a Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of Defense, Gates two people who are veterans of you know these offices points these people and then those two people gates and clinton who are old washington hands and tons of other people inside the national security bureaucracies they're all pushing him to say no 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 you can't leave afghanistan you have to do more in afghanistan right i mean that's really what happened to him He's just sandbag that, you know, and any intelligent person would see that we need to stay in Afghanistan and we have to increase the number of troops. So that becomes the dynamic in and of itself. And the case that Paul raised is actually interesting because it is true that Joe Biden as vice president was one of the very few people at that level to say to the president, you know what, it's not gonna do any good. We're just exposing more of our kids to danger. Um, so that's sort of an interesting, you know, example. But that's partly what we're up against is, you know, this, these, law, these entrenched structures of people who have an interventionist, militaristic approach to international relations. So again, that leaves us with the question of public opinion, right? It's like, can, can an, a mobilized public force a change in the direction of our foreign policy? Because I'm not so sure it's coming from any other place, and that I guess that's the, the logic of it. I'll just point out that Robert said in the chat, from what he sees in Joe Biden's plan, it doesn't look like he wants to cut the military budget or take a more diplomatic approach. So that would sort of go to uh, support a little bit of of what uh, Professor Eisenberg was saying there, um, and I think it, he's right. And I'll, I'll just add one thing to this, and I, I, I think it's a great question, and I'd love to hear from what, what students think. Um, but I detect a little bit of movement, right? So, and I'm going to just back up a little bit. During the Obama administration, um, uh, one of his national security advisors talked about the blob, the foreign policy blob, right? And that was more of a critique of sort of the get of of the foreign policy establishment critiquing the Obama administration for every little thing. But sort of that blob is sort of that blob comment um, has grown in a different way, where you have more, uh, for lack of a better term, we want to say progressive voices in some of the foreign policy debates. People like Matt Duss, uh, who was Bernie Sanders' uh, foreign policy advisor, um, who are writing things like um, in, in foreign affairs, as Stephen Kinzer talked about foreign affairs. Matt Duss has a piece in Foreign Affairs this weekend, or this past week, excuse me, um, that said, you know, we need a, a, a commission to look at the interventions of the post 9-11 era. Um, we need to um, re-examine uh, all the damages that have been, that were, that were done uh, in the name of counterterrorism after the 9-11 attacks. And those voices are starting to come out, right? But they might not be powerful enough because I wanna go back to Robert's point. Joe Biden's plan probably is written by people we would say are firmly entrenched in sort of the foreign policy establishment. So um, there's a little bit of movement, but maybe not as much as we would like. So let's go back to the question that Dr. Eisenberg raised given in, in within that context. Can people make a difference? You people like you and I, voters. Yeah, I really like, um, and you know, not I, in my own class. I'm really mean, and I call on people, and they get very upset. <laughs> so in but my I class, am, though. I'm really interested in this, in student responses to this question in terms of does it seem even realistic to imagine that regular people, not foreign affairs specialists would exercise significant control over foreign policy decisions. Does that seem practical to you or are you struck with the fact that it's not gonna happen? 
Peter's got his hand up, so. Um, I feel like it's kind of like unrealistic. I like I think about this like all the time, and it's like, what could I do to like influence the government and like policy on like Sudan or something? Like, there's nothing like I can personally do, but I feel like you can probably get there by like getting a job in the field. Like one of the questions that I was gonna ask like you guys was like, what is a good job that I could like get after college to influence foreign policy or something like that? It's a great question. Yeah, it is a good question. And I do wanna, uh, Peter, you mentioned Sudan in particular and sort of what's going on there. There are individual cases where public pressure can make a difference. Think about the campaign in the 1980s against the apartheid regime in South Africa. Um, that was largely a, a grassroots uh, movement, um, or, or lead, and it put a lot of pressure on domestic politics or on on, on Reagan to, to do something about it when he really didn't want to do something about it. So, there may be some d discrete instances where where that can do. The larger issue of interventionism and the U.S. role in the world is really tougher. Um, but certainly, as a foreign policy professional, you can do that. Um, the kinds of jobs for that. Um, it's a good question, right? Um, so don't become a professor because nobody will listen to you. I mean, that's or that was a half a joke, but um, our influence is, is minimal. Um, but they're, they're all, I mean, DC is the place to, to be with us, right? Um, in the sense of working your way up, um, you got to think about the entire foreign policy apparatus. Congressional committees are critical. Right. So working on Capitol Hill, you may think is all domestic politics. But if you think about the House Foreign Affairs Committee or the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, they're the ones that are examining executive policy. Um, they're the ones that are, are raising questions. You can really shape the debate. Um, you may not be able to accomplish actual policy changes, but you can shape the debate um, with those kinds of positions. So. Uh, so that I don't take up too much time. If you wanna talk more about that, get in contact with me, Peter. I'd be glad to, to uh, chat with you about this. Well, can I just come in for one minute? Yeah, because yeah. We're, about to, we're about to end up. You know, I think, I think the reality is that if you wanna have any influence, you know, or pitch in, for that purpose, you actually need to have, um, to be working in the office of a Senator or a Congressperson who's sympathetic to an anti-interventionist, anti-militaristic foreign policy. If you're not working for a person with that orientation, your ideas are gonna probably, you know, not be, probably be ignored. But the other thing is that there's a lot of nonprofits around in Washington, just they won't make you rich, right? But are actually doing things to really challenge um, you know, what's going on now. And some of these entities have a lot of young people working for them. I'm just thinking about Win Without War as one, you know, as one example, the Institute for Policy Studies, which actually is headed by my former students. I'm very proud of that. You know, you can just check out the Institute for Policy Studies and see, you know, the range of the kinds of things, you, you know, that could be done. Or the American Friends Service Committee, also big Washington office where there's a role for you. So, I think when you're thinking about, you know, what your views are, what, you know, how to be effective, I think we want to widen your, your, your sense of the options, although alternative organizations are going to not make you as rich as you might be otherwise, but it may have other satisfactions for you apart from, from that. So thank you for adding that. And I couldn't agree more. Um, we do need to wrap up because I know there are other sessions and classes and things like that. So um, again, thanks for, for joining us. Thanks for the questions. Uh, thanks for your interest. Um, and, and you know what I said to Peter, I, I'll say to all of you, if you have any, if you want to talk further about this, send me an email and we can set up a Zoom. Um, I'm sure Dr. Eisenberg would do the same sort of thing. So um, enjoy the rest of Day of Dialogue and thanks so much for joining us today. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Oh, Bye thank you everyone. so much. Bye. Thank you.